Japan up close. So the term soft power was initially created by the political scientist Joseph Nye in the late 1980s as a way of talking about the continued resilience of the United States despite reports that it was a country in decline. At that time, there were many reports that America, because of its struggling in industrial sectors, was going to fall behind economic challengers like Japan or at that time, West Germany. Nye argued that America's values, uh, openness, tolerance, uh, democracy, and so forth, allowed America to have the ability to persuade other countries of its positions. Hard power is the ability to coerce other countries, to make country B do what country A wants. But if country A has soft power, they can persuade country B to do what country B wants or to persuade country B to want the same things that country A wants. And the term itself is attractive for many reasons, partly because I think most of us think that the world is more complicated than just material power. I think the problem for Nye is that from, from uh, many political scientists don't take the term that seriously because it seems a little optimistic, which is to say it seems to put a lot of control in the hands of states over the values that they ostensibly project, which is to say that you know values and, and culture and ideas and so forth, they're important. They may reshape the world in all sorts of ways, but it doesn't mean that the country that's the source of those values itself gets the benefits that America can control how people think about democracy or that Japan can control how people who watch anime are going to feel about Japan or Asian international relations. And that's true, not just for America and Japan, but also for Germany or China or Great Britain or wherever. So the term itself became popular back in the uh, 90s and onward in different countries. But I think a lot of political scientists still treat it with a bit of skepticism um, because we're not sure that you can prove that it actually does affect political outcomes in the straightforward sense that I think Nye thought. I think it is a more popular thing to, for people to talk about, but I'm not sure that it plays a more important role because I'm not sure it played an important role in the first place. I mean, if we think that America itself, that its values are largely about democracy, or about openness and so forth. That might be good for the United States, but what if a democratically elected government in another country likes democracy, believes in democracy, and then chooses policies on security, on alliances and so forth that don't fit with American goals? D democracies can choose what they want. And I, I think that those of us who are skeptical about soft power would argue that it doesn't work for individual governments the way that people always ha have argued. So I don't think it's less important than it used to be. I think what it, the term itself prevents us from thinking in more complicated ways about what culture, what values actually do in the international system. Because I think Japan itself gets affected by these values, that America itself gets uh, gets affected, that no country is, a, is just a standing, stable target. All these cultures are changing all the time. And so trying to suggest what an individual country's values are, what its culture is, is I think a, a political act. It's not really um, something that's analytically useful. I think that Japan itself has engaged in a more elaborate soft power set of strategies than many other governments have. And I think that's partly because when Japan was in its own period of reported national decline back in the 1990s, I think that many writers, many diplomats and so forth took to the idea of soft power as the thing that was going to project Japan back onto the world stage, that maybe we're not the economic miracle that we were in the 1970s and the 1980s, but now we have popular anime, manga, video games, and so forth. And so I think particularly when you have American journalists like Douglas McRae writing that Japan has gross national cool, when Spirited Away wins the Academy Award for Best Animated Picture, when Japanese video games are doing it well around the world, you can see many officials, many offices trying to think about how to actually promote Japanese soft power. But it's really hard. What I think they've done well is to articulate the importance of having strong and varied content industries. And I 100% agree with that. So I think that what's been beneficial about Japan's soft power strategies, not that it generates soft power, 
but that it actually supports artists, that it supports creators, that it supports creative industries. That's good for employment. It might be good for tourism. It might be good for many things in Japan. That's not really about Japan getting its way on the international stage, but Japanese people being able to live better and happier lives than they would otherwise because creative industries are receiving the support that we would want. I myself don't think so, but I also don't necessarily think that that's necessarily that important. I mean, it depends how you define a great power. Uh, there's a lot of definitions for that. But I guess one that I, I saw and I liked, one definition is that it's sort of the, the a widely recognized power that is also widely recognized to be able to project its strength on the global stage, which is to say to act anywhere. And certainly Japan is a very, very powerful country, one of the richest countries in the world, large population, a large imprint in international relations. But I think that when people talk about international relations in uh, Latin America, for example, or in Africa, they don't necessarily have to talk about Japan in any direct sense. They probably do have to talk about America, the United States. They probably do have to talk increasingly about China, that China plays roles in these countries. That doesn't mean China can do whatever it wants. It doesn't mean America can do whatever it wants. But it does mean that it's harder to think about politics around the world taking place without Chinese or American influence. I don't think that Japan quite has that. What Japan does have, however, is a global presence recognized around the world, well known around the world, certainly powerful in the region, also powerful, I think, where the Japanese government chooses to use its power, which is largely in collaboration with other G8 countries, or G7 countries, I beg your pardon, with um with in, in East and Southeast Asia, in the Asia Pacific, and so forth. And I think the Japanese government has chosen to have a global footprint while also having a, a focus in certain regions in which they believe that their interests are most at stake. And so I wouldn't call Japan a great power, but I do think it's an important power that is internationally recognized. So for me, it's it's not really an important definition exactly, but I guess if we use that definition, I'm not sure I would put Japan in that category, but that's not an insult to Japan in any way. Uh, because I think even, even calling a country a great power probably overstates what it can actually accomplish. It can't, a, a great power still can't do everything it wants to do. At the height of America's power, back in the 1990s, America could, still couldn't do a lot of things that it probably wanted to do internationally. It's really hard to evaluate. I mean, even now, even decades later, political economists are still struggling to understand the effect of Japanese industrial policies in automobiles, electronics, and so forth in the 1960s and 1970s. Trying to evaluate that with regard to the content industries today is super hard, especially because just defining what the content or creative industries are is really, really difficult. So if we can't measure them, it's really hard to know how to measure their effect in the rest of the economy. That said, there's no question that millions of Japanese are employed in creative industries. Everything from the anime that are set, that are viewed around the world on YouTube or on Netflix or wherever, to people who run local video studios, making making videos for companies, universities, and so forth, artists who write music for big movies, and artists who run their own little uh, you know piano school in the middle of a suburb in 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 in, in Shikoku. I mean, the. The range of employment is really remarkable. I think that what having a, a Cool Japan initiative does is it allows people to focus attention on that as being valuable for the country, as being something that's good for the country. That's not just about a few artists here and there, but recognizing that to have a sort of a meaningful life as a nation, it's good for citizens themselves to be able to engage broadly and to dream widely about the kinds of creative lives that they want to explore and have. So I, I am not sure I can easily measure the effects on the economy, but I don't think anyone else can either. The studies I've seen seem at best pretty inconclusive. I think to me, what's more valuable about it is the fact that it reminds us that we can we can talk about this as being meaningful and important for the nation itself, as something that people should aspire to and want to support. I, I wish we had a little bit more focus on this in the United States, to be honest.
That's a great question. Um, and obviously, the war in the Ukraine, I think, reminds us of a few things about politics. For sure, this is largely about the ability of Russia to engage in military activities um, in attacking a neighbor, to place troops there, and to make it very, very difficult for Ukraine to, 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 to push that out. And, and we can refer to that as hard power. By the same token, the support from around the world that Ukraine has received and that continues to receive today might be viewed as a combination. Some countries might be responding to support Ukraine because they themselves are worried about Russian aggression. They're worried about the possibility of it happening to them. I think for others, there's a view that something about the Ukraine is worthy of protection, that it's democracy or that it's a quasi-democracy or that it has had engaged in democratic elections and was basically the victim of um, an unprovoked attack by Russia. And once you start talking about it that way, the focus turns a little bit away from straightforward hard power to something else about the way that we we think about what's right and what's just in international relations, what we want. And I think the Japanese government is responding to that. The Japanese government's engagement in this isn't because it's really worried that Russia is going to attack Japan. At least I haven't heard any reasonable person suggest that that's likely to take place anytime soon. I think they are concerned about the uh, example that might be set and the possibility of creating the, the, the conditions for future military adventures in the Asia Pacific, which Japan definitely does not want to see. But I think by and large, I think the Japanese government is responding to the sort of widespread outrage about the Russian invasion, the the human consequences of it and so forth. And so in some ways, I think you can argue that the Japanese government is trying to use this to its advantage, trying to show itself to be a powerful, capable military and political leader in the Asia Pacific that can contribute to international relations. That's good for Japan. But it also shows how Japan's interests are themselves shaped in an international environment in which ideas about justice, about ideas about human rights, about ideas about decency themselves affect how we talk about what states can and cannot do. And to me, those are the sort of really interesting questions that are provoked by the war and by Japan's response to it. With regard to coronavirus, I think the Japanese government has, like most governments, struggled with coming up with the best response. And we still don't know what the best way to handle, of course, a pandemic is. I think the government's decision to end the travel restrictions, to make it easier for people to come into Japan, suggests that they were concerned that Japan's reputation was going to get hurt. I think that's probably true. And certainly as you know, a resident, a foreigner in Japan, I myself was impacted by that. I'm glad that those restrictions have ended. By the same token, it's not entirely clear to me that this was going to have a devastating effect on Japan's international power. And I think that discussions of that sometimes used the sort of premise of soft power to make what was basically a moral argument. Japan should open its borders because it's it's bad to keep them closed. Um, I think because there's so much that we don't know about how the pandemics work, about what the best possible strategy is, a lot of the way that we talk about soft power is really an expression of our own values and our own judgments and then a way of talking about states as if they are responding or handling those in exactly the way that we would want. And, and I think that's you know another concern about something as slippery as soft power, which is that it allows for a certain amount of emotional or political projection on the part of analysts, rather than fairly hard analytical analysis of, of, of what is the best way to approach, uh, approach the pandemic. Um, I, I don't think Japan's... Um, global position, to be honest, has been dramatically affected by either the um, the Russia in the Russian invasion of Ukraine, or by the Coronavirus pandemic. Um, I think that Japan has handled both reasonably well, which is what we would expect of Japan. Um, it certainly hasn't made itself look terribly bad, I think, in, in either particular case. Um, and I think it's muddling through very, very difficult circumstances, but I don't think anyone is really looking to sort of determine what Japan's next step ought to be, at least on the global stage. I think people who support Ukraine are probably glad that Japan has provided economic and political support. And I think most people should be glad that Japan has been largely 
a, a success story on the pandemic, but uh, it's complicated. I know that's a very long answer. I actually doubt it because I don't think, to be honest, I I don't think that governments ultimately rely on it that much, which is to say that when if the Japanese government um, wants to achieve a uh, some kind of security arrangement involving the Quad or involving its relationship with Australia or the United States or something like that, I don't think it's going to rely on the love of you know Americans or Indians or or Australians for anime. Right. It's not going to go into a diplomatic meeting and say, we know we we made Pokemon. <laughs> so, and, and the same way that an American isn't going to, you know, go into a room to to make a case for, um, you know, cooperation against Russia and the Ukraine isn't going to go into the room and say, well, you love Hollywood movies. Right? I mean, no one's going to do anything like that. So I don't I don't think that they'll rely on it too much. I think uh, to me, the bigger danger is that um, people are led to believe that international affection for one's popular culture, one's values, or so forth, will immediately translate into diplomatic, good diplomatic outcomes. I mean, you know, just to to, to name an obvious case in the United in the United States, um, I think when Prime Minister Abe visited um, the United States, I think back in 2015, 14, 15, um, he visited Harvard and was protested there by a number of students, many of whom were Asian and Asian American uh, students whose family roots for many, I think, would have been in, in China and or in Korea. And I imagine that for many of those kids, there was a deep familiarity with and deep affection for a lot of things in Japanese pop culture. I mean, among the communities in the United States in which Japanese pop culture has been really, really strong have been Asian American communities. And so I'd be very surprised if a lot of those kids in the, the in in these protests, a lot of these college students in these protests hadn't grown up watching anime, didn't have some familiarity with manga and so forth, maybe even J-pop. But it didn't mean that they necessarily accepted Japanese views of the history of World War II or so forth. In the same way with the United States, I think that um, we can sort of fool ourselves into believing that, well, democracy has spread in the Middle East or in Southeast Asia, everyone loves, I mean, just look at it. America, everyone loves Hollywood movies and think that it, therefore everyone's going to support, you know, the war with Iraq or the war in Afghanistan or whatever. And it's like, no, why would they, they view their interests differently and they may view American behavior differently. It doesn't mean that they hate America or they, they hate what they think of as American values, but their understanding of America is complicated because America is a complicated place. And I think the same is true of Japan. So I think the issue isn't that governments will rely on soft power too much. It's rather that they might trick themselves or sort of journalists and, and commentators on the topic might trick themselves into believing that having strong soft power or having strong uh, culture industries um, internationally will translate into diplomatic gains. Um, I think the actual strategists in most governments probably don't really think that they might want to believe it, but I, I, I have a hard time believing that they, they put a lot of stock into it. I've never seen it happen myself. That's one of the hardest questions I think about soft power. Um, and it's one that I don't fully understand. I know some have argued that the reliance, for example, in Japan on line as a social, uh, you know, as, as, as an extremely popular social network maybe limiting because it doesn't have the same global footprint that something like Facebook does, or increasingly um, something like TikTok does, or Instagram, or so forth. Um, and that might be true up to a point, which is to say that if all the content in a country, all the ideas or so forth, are focused on platforms that are not shared globally, I guess that probably does probably limit your ability to get a message across. But again, I, I think that it probably overstates the effectiveness of those messages um, that are actually distributed globally. I mean, for example, um, even though Facebook is, of course, um, an American-led company and has global reach and so forth, it's controversial around the world, right? And it's not like something goes onto Facebook and therefore everyone around the world unquestionably accepts it. People fight about it. They argue about it. They debate it. They debate how much the American government controls it, whether censorship is affecting things, 
Facebook itself is going to make strategies so it doesn't offend audiences in China or the Chinese government or so forth. So I think that it's a complicated set of relationships, but I think that probably focusing too much on the national origin of the social network itself um, probably draws attention away from, I think, the more complex ways in which people draw upon and embed information in their own lives, guiding how they're going to do things, how they're going to make judgments and so forth. Great question. Um, I, I I hope that um, I hope Japan sort of keeps doing what it's doing. I mean, I, I know that among some people in the creative industries, there are arguments that cool Japan doesn't go far enough or it doesn't do enough to support the industries. And as someone who loves Japanese movies, as someone who I don't watch a lot of anime, but my kids do, and I certainly know how popular they are, and as someone who who admires manga and Japanese playwrights and and and, and Japanese screenwriters and so forth, as someone who who enjoys all that, I, I wish that there were a lot more support for it here, just as I I would want anywhere. I I think what's probably most beneficial for Japan on this front is to keep investing nationally in the establishment of sites where people can engage in creative activities. I mean, we don't talk about this much, but um, because so much of the soft power discussion is really about, you know, digital content that's produced largely in Tokyo and other major cities. But for decades, Japan had a, a policy of ensuring that there were art centers and auditoriums and concert halls all around the country. And they exist even today, and they still have some public support and so forth. And it means that artists, musicians, et cetera, tour around the country and play even in relatively small towns, small towns that may be shrinking even now. But it means that kids growing up in Japan, anywhere in Japan, can get exposed in one way or another to performing arts, to visual arts, to music, to art, to drawing. That's not just controlled by the mass media on television or in films or whatever, but that there's actually sort of a live engagement with this that may excite young people to make creations. We don't know where the next genius is going to come from. We don't know where the next brilliant creator is going to come from. Maybe it's someone who's living here in Tokyo and, you know, is deeply embedded in a very, very dense media environment here. But it could be a kid from a small town in Aomori or a small town in 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 uh, in, uh, in Ehime or so forth, who has the opportunity to see a concert, who has the opportunity to see a public performance in their town, and it inspires them to learn an instrument. It inspires them to start drawing. It inspires them to start writing plays, and those may be the things that actually become the next popular craze 15, 20 years down the road. So I, I think what I would like to see is the sort of level of engagement that Japan has had in the past, mostly for the promotion of regions around Japan, but with a recognition that what's good for individual regions in Japan is good for Japan itself. And that what's good for Japanese kids in smaller towns in Japan is good for Japan itself. So that's what I would like to see is maybe not so much the focus on what this will do on the global stage, but trust that Japan has such talented, creative, thoughtful people that if they're given the opportunity, if they're inspired to try to create something, they're going to be globally successful because they can't help it. They're too good not to be noticed. Japan up close.